We're live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India Live, India's Voice to the World. I'm Lipakshi Kurana, coming up in the next 30 minutes. Cyclone Mikjom likely to make landfall today. Red alert for few districts in Andhra Pradesh. Offices, schools closed, flights halted in Chennai. Israel presses ground offensive in southern Gaza as internet and phone services go down. UN chief urges Israel to avoid worsening aid crisis. And in sports, the Hockey Men's Junior World Cup 2023 begins in Kuala Lumpur today. Two-time champions in their face Republic of Korea in tournament opener. Moving on, the southern Indian state of Andhra Pradesh has witnessed heavy rainfall today with Tridupati and Ellore districts facing the brunt of heavy downpour leading to inundation and flooding at many places. Rescue measures are being undertaken on war footing. High alert has been sounded in Bapatla district of Andhra Pradesh where the landfall is expected to happen today during the forenoon. The Nizampatnam harbour in Bapapitla district hoisted cyclone warning signal 10 indicating a severe cyclone. NDRF is already deployed and more teams are on standby to mobilise as needed. And shifting focus, it's now been four days since the week-long temporary ceasefire between Israel and Gaza expired and the Israeli military are continuing to push south in the Gaza Strip. Israeli tanks and other armoured vehicles are now reported to be operating close to Khan Yunis, the largest city in the southern Gaza Strip. The intensified strikes come after having largely gained control of the now devastated north. Meanwhile, the Israel Defence Forces are repeatedly asking tens of thousands of Palestinians to move from areas across the South. The IDF believes Hamas commanders are in the city where hundreds of thousands are sheltering since fleeing the fight flighting in the north. An Israeli army spokesperson Daniel Hagari in a briefing said the Hamas deliberately embeds itself among civilians so that Gazans will bear the consequences of Hamas atrocities. He added that the forces are taking extensive measures to mitigate harm to the civilians that Hamas uses as shields. We have entered a new phase in our war against Hamas. Hamas broke the humanitarian pause when it violated the hostage release agreement by refusing to release women, children, and babies as agreed. Hamas also fired rockets at Israeli homes. It should be clear to everyone by now, Hamas chooses war. It has been eight weeks since October 7th and Hamas is still holding 137 of our people hostage, babies, the elderly, women and men. Hamas does not value human life, Israeli or Palestinian. Hamas is willing to sacrifice its own people to advance its genocidal agenda. We will operate in maximum force against Hamas terrorists and infrastructures while minimizing harm to the civilian that Hamas places around them as shields. And the White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said the United States will continue to press for the release of additional hostages held by Hamas in Gaza. Uh, we're still talking about trying to find a way forward on hostages. Uh, we're talking about sustaining and expanding the humanitarian assistance, making it into Gaza. Right now, Hamas is refusing to release civilian women who should have been part of the agreement. And it is that refusal by Hamas that has caused uh, the end of the hostage agreement and therefore the end of the pause in hostilities. Also, Sullivan said that the U.S. expects Israel to avoid attacking areas identified by Israeli authorities as no-strike zones in Gaza. Just to take a step back, um, what Israel has done is it said, this is the area where we are going to conduct ground maneuver. Please, everybody move out of this area so that you're not going to be caught in the crossfire. 
They have also indicated that there are areas where there will be no strike zones. And in those zones, we do expect Israel to follow through on not striking. Meanwhile, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres appealed to Israel on Monday to avoid further action that would exasperate the already catastrophic humanitarian situation in Gaza. UN spokesperson Stefan Dujaric said, and I quote, the Secretary General reiterates the need for unimpeded and sustained humanitarian aid flow to meet the needs of the people throughout the Strip. For people ordered to evacuate, there is no way safe to go and very little to survive on, unquote. Also, Israel had an event at the UN in New York focused on sexual violence against women during the October 7th attack by Hamas. Israel has been critical of the world body's response to the attacks. Israeli ambassador to UN, Gildan Erdan, said the crimes against women on the 7th of October have been ignored by the UN. UN women ignored all of the proof and, and were blind to all the evidence, including video footage of clear testimonies of sexual crimes. Instead of immediately supporting the victims, UN women brazenly suggested that Hamas's gender-based violence be investigated by a blatantly anti-Semitic UN body. This is UN women's response. So I will state clearly today, the investigation that truly must be carried out is an investigation of UN women's indifference to the heinous crimes against Israeli women. Meanwhile, U.S. Senator from New York, Kristen Gillibrand, said that the UN must hold Hamas accountable for the heinous crimes. The world community must do more. It must demand accountability for these intolerable crimes, the United Nations must denounce Hamas as a terrorist organization that uses rape as a weapon of war. The United Nations must live up to its purpose of upholding the principles of international law, and the United Nations must condemn these evil crimes against humanity. Moving on now, the United States charged a former ambassador to Bolivia with spying for Cuba for over 40 years. Victor Manuel Roca, who served as U.S. ambassador to Bolivia from 2000 to 2002, was charged with committing multiple federal crimes, including acting as an illegal foreign agent and using a fraudulently obtained passport, the Justice Department said in a statement. U.S. Attorney General Merrick told reporters on Monday that Roca made incriminating statements to an undercover agent and that he referred to the United States as the enemy. Roca was arrested and is expected to appear before a federal judge in Miami. And moving on, Cuba and Iran signed a series of bilateral agreements in Tehran during a meeting between President Miguel diaz Canel and Iran's Ibrahim Raisi. A total of seven documents and agreements for the enhancement of bilateral cooperation were signed. After the signing of the agreement ceremony, diaz Canel also demanded an immediate ceasefire and the conditions for the creation of a Palestinian state to be facilitated. Cuba has been under U.S. embargo since 1962 and, like Iran, is subject to U.S. Sanctions. Well, a massive manhunt is underway for the attackers who bombed a Catholic mass that killed four people in the southern Philippines. Police are looking into at least two suspects they believe were behind the blast, which Islamic State militants claimed. The blast claimed by the Islamic State group happened on Sunday at Mindano State University's gymnasium in Marawi. Security officials have said the bombing may have been retaliatory attack for a series of military operations against Islamist militant groups in recent days that killed multiple fighters. And Donald Trump's call for people to guard the vote in 2024 has sparked concern about potential violence in the next year's election. The former president, the front runner for the Republican presidential nomination, repeated his unfounded claims of widespread voter fraud in 2020 at a rally in Ankeny, Iowa. He used these claims as a justification for the call, telling supporters to go into Democratic-run cities that he has previously disparaged to guard the vote in 
2024. Looking ahead to next year's general election, Trump said it was important to scrutinize the vote in the battleground states likely to determine the outcome. And Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen appealed to voters to think of what had happened to Chinese-controlled Hong Kong when they cast their ballots next month, saying peace must be backed up with a commitment to boost defenses. Taiwan prepares for presidential and parliamentary elections on January 13th as China ramps up military pressure to assert its claims. China and Taiwan's main opposition party, the Kuomintang, have crossed the election as a choice between war and peace. China detests Taiwan's ruling Democratic Progressive Party and its presidential candidate, Vice President Lai ching te calling them dangerous separatists. And India has slashed greenhouse gas emissions by 33 percent from 2005 to 2019, highlighting the country's effort to promote renewable energy. Did India's Tapas Bhattacharya reports for more. And moving on to world news now, three survivors were found in Indonesia after the Marapi volcano erupted in West Sumatra as search operations, which were halted temporarily over safety concerns, resumed. The rescue team recovered 11 dead bodies out of 75 climbers who were in the area at the time of eruption. There were 49 climbers evacuated from the area early on Monday and many were being treated for burns. There were still 12 climbers missing. An American woman died after a shark attacked her while paddle boarding in the Bahamas on Monday. The woman was from Boston and was with a relative when the attack occurred. The police said that a lifeguard rescued the pair. White fatal shark attacks are not common in the Bahamas. At least two others have been reported recently. A kangaroo that escaped its handlers during transport to a new home was captured on Monday east of Toronto after a weekend in the wild. The kangaroo punched one of the officers in the face during the capture. The female kangaroo hopped over her handlers during the rest stop. Officers on patrol caught the kangaroo. Children and adults were delighted in Chile's capital at a Christmas Paris parade that paid tribute to the Walt Disney Company for its 100 year anniversary. Crowds packed Santiago's main avenues to get a glimpse of giant balloons depicting iconic Disney characters such as Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. This was the 12th edition of the Paris parade, which got cancelled during the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, India has slashed greenhouse gas emissions by 33 percent from 2005 to 2019, highlighting the country's effort to promote renewable energy. Did India's Tapas Bhattacharya reports for more. India has shown remarkable progress in reducing its greenhouse gas emissions. India's emission intensity dropped by an astonishing 33 percent from 2005 to 2019. This achievement places India well on track to fulfill its commitment to the United Nations Convention on Climate Change, aiming to reduce emission intensity by 45 percent from 2005 level by 2030. Notably, the country experienced the fastest reduction in emission intensity to date, with an annual average reduction of 3 percent in the period of 2016-2019. This remarkable progress is largely attributed to government's initiatives towards renewable, despite fossil fuel maintaining a dominant position in the energy mix. The significant increase in forest cover has played a pivotal role in achieving this remarkable feat. As of 2019, India boasts of a substantial forest cover of 24.56%, covering 80.73 million hectares. India's GDP between 2005 to 2019 has grown with cumulative annual growth rate of about 7%, whereas the emission grew about 4%. This shows that India has successfully continued to decouple its economic growth from greenhouse gas emissions, resulting in the reduction of the emission intensity of its GDP by 33% between 2005 and 2019.
India's share of non-fossil sources based install capacity of electricity generation in 2023 is more than 41 percent. India achieved its NDC target of 40 percent cumulative electric power installed capacity from non-fossil fuel based energy sources in 2021, nine years in advance of the target date of 2030. As India continues its journey towards a sustainable future, the focus on renewable energy, increased forest cover and innovative solutions like green hydrogen mark a significant stride in mitigating climate change. Tapush Bhattacharya's report, TD India. And coming up, still to come in this edition of DD India Live. Zelensky to address centers on military aid today as White House warns Putin could win if Ukraine aid dries up. UK unveils staff new rules designed to cut immigrant numbers. And Rafael Nadal, the former tennis world number one, gears up for a comeback after hip surgery. Every year, hundreds of thousands of Indian students go abroad to pursue higher education. But now, India has opened its doors for foreign higher education institutions who can set up and operate their campuses here. Bringing these foreign university campuses will provide an additional opportunity to our students uh, to study in foreign universities while staying in India. How will you ensure that only the best universities come to India? They should be within the top 500 ranks in the global rankings. Although we have not specified any global ranking agency, but in general, or subject-wise, they should be within the uh, 500 global rankings. Welcome back. You're watching DD India Live. I'm Lipak Shikurana. And moving on, the White House is warning that funding for Ukraine will run out by the end of the year. It said Kyiv would be kneecapped in its war against Russia if Congress fails to approve new aid. From Washington, DD India's Kate Fisher reports for more. There is no magical pot of funding available. We are out of money and nearly out of time. That's the stark warning from the White House's budget director in a letter to congressional leaders calling on them to pass President Joe Biden's request for $106 billion in emergency funding. That total also covers his other foreign policy priorities, including Israel and the Indo-Pacific. Shalanda Young said that without congressional action, the U.S. simply will run out of money by the end of the year to procure more weapons and equipment for Ukraine and to provide equipment from U.S. military stocks. But President Biden's funding request remains stuck in gridlock on Capitol Hill under mounting Republican opposition to helping Kyiv. Some lawmakers, especially in the Senate, where backing for Ukraine runs deeper, are trying to negotiate a bipartisan deal that would contain aid for Kyiv alongside new immigration procedures to reduce the number of migrants arriving in the U.S. through its southern border. But those talks appear to be faltering, and even if it gets through the Senate, it's unclear if it can pass the Republican-led House, whose new speaker, Mike Johnson, has been sceptical of funding for Ukraine. Kate Fisher in Washington, reporting for DD India. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has been invited to address U.S. Senate at a closed briefing via video as part of a classified briefing to hear what is at stake. The closed briefing for senators is scheduled for 3 p.m. EST on Tuesday and will feature U.S. national security officials. And a long line of trucks unfolded on the side of the road as Polish drivers have been blocking the crossings since November 6th, demanding the reinstatement of a system where Ukrainian companies need permits to operate in the bloc and European truckers require permits to enter Ukraine. The permits were abolished after Russia's invasion of Ukraine last year in response to protests causing lines of up to 18 kilometers on the Polish side at major crossings. Ukraine opened new small crossings in Urnariv, Dolobachev to allow empty trucks to leave faster. 
And Russian President Vladimir Putin witnessed a simulation of the nuclear button but declined to press it. Putin visited a vast exhibition of Russian achievements in what looked like a warm-up for an imminent re-election campaign. Putin was briefed about a Soviet nuclear bomb design and shown a mock control panel for launching a nuclear test before observing images of a blast and mushroom cloud through a viewing window. And the ninth Nepal International Trade Fair organized by the Federation of Nepalese Chambers of Commerce and Industry, which ran for five days, ends today at Kathmandu. A total of 210 exhibition stalls from Bangladesh, India, China and Pakistan, along with host uh, Nepal, was set up in fair. Under the aegis of ICC, more than 30 Indian companies participated in the Indian Pavilion, showcasing their capital goods in hydropower and solar energy, electrical goods, engineering goods and others. Bangladesh textile and leather goods of Pakistan attracted the locals. And now let's take a look at other stories making news today. The propulsion module of Chandrayaan-3 has successfully returned to Earth's orbit by Indian Space Research Organization, which was initially intended for lunar operations. Three workers were rescued hours after more than 10 feet are trapped under the sack of grains due to a storage unit collapse in the Indian state of Karnataka. The Vixit Bharat Sankalp Yatra reached Fuldara, village of Hapur district in India's Uttar Pradesh, where villagers were given information about the schemes being run by the central government, during which many departments set up stalls and gave on-the-spot information about the schemes. Heating system has been installed in Kankaria Zoo, located in the Indian state of Gujarat, to keep the animals protected from the cold weather. Well, the UK is sharply increasing the salary required to secure a skilled worker visa for the country. It's part of plans to try and bring down overall net migration numbers to Britain. Did India's Oli Parrott reports from London. UK Home Secretary James Cleverly confirming new measures designed to bring down that overall net migration number and the headline move that he is making is raising significantly the salary requirement that you're going to need to get a skilled job visa for the UK. So anyone coming, for example, from India to Britain to work here in the United Kingdom will have to prove uh, in future that they have a salary for their new job um, of 38 8,700 pounds. Now that is around uh, 4 million Indian rupees per year and that is up from previously 26,200 pounds. So it is a major spike in that salary threshold that is going to be required. Now uh, there are going to be exceptions in the health and social care sector for example because the UK government accepts that the National Health Service does need a lot of workers from overseas to fill all of the positions that it is required to fill to keep the NHS running. One of the other changes, significant changes, that the Home Secretary James Cleverly has announced is that uh, it'll be much harder now for dependents of people who do secure visas to come to the UK with them. The Home Secretary says that that part of the system has been, in his words, abused in the past. And so uh, he's clamping down on the number of people uh, that will come to the UK as dependents of people who secure visas. As I say, the reason the Home Secretary is making these changes is because in the last 12-month period, net migration to the UK was over 745,000. The UK government says that is far too high and needs to come down, and that's why it's making these changes. It also is going to be making changes, and we're due to hear some details in the coming days, to plans around illegal migration. And the UK still insists it's going to get its plan up and running to see some asylum seekers sent to Rwanda to have their claims processed there rather than in the UK. Um, the opposition Labour Party says that this is all chaotic. They say that these are problems of the government's uh, own making. But Home Secretary James Cleverly says that these changes will make a difference uh, and bring down the overall number by around 300,000 um, as a result of these changes of people who can come to the UK uh, and get visas to work here. So significant changes from the government, controversial ones though. Ollie Barrett in London reporting for DD India.
And in sports, two-time champions India will today start their campaign in the FAI uh, Hockey Men's Junior World Cup 2023 against the Republic of Korea in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Uttam Singh will captain the Indian side. The 13th edition of the Junior Men's Hockey World Cup will see 16 teams divided equally into four groups compete for the two top spots in their group and secure a place in the quarterfinals. The bottom two teams from each group will enter classification rounds. And in tennis, Rafael Nadal, the former world number one, is gearing up for a comeback after hip surgery. Having last played at the Australian Open due to the hip flexor issue, Nadal underwent surgery in June and now aims to embrace the journey. In a recent Instagram video, he shared his nerves about returning after nearly a year, expressing a desire to forgive himself if the comeback is gradual. Well, that's all for this edition of DD India Live. Well, let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter and Instagram. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Lipak Shikurana from all of us here in Delhi. Thanks for watching DD India Live.